Welcome back. We're going to take take two at Phoenix Framework. So how is Phoenix different? It brings back the simplicity and joy in writing modern web applications by mixing tried and true technologies with a fresh breeze of functional ideas. Okay, sure, I'll buy that. Um, you can create rich, interactive experiences across browsers, native modal app, mobile apps, and embedded devices with real-time streaming technology called channels. Leverages Here's where I actually start to buy this. It leverages Erlang VM ability to handle millions of connections alongside Elixir's beautiful syntax and productive tooling for building fault-tolerant systems. I can buy that. Um, I get the philosophy that's making sense that you don't want to write web applications the way that many web applications are written. I've seen some, they're disgusting, you don't want to do things in a non-functional way. Um, and to that extent, you do want to use um, an environment like Erlang VM, which has strong ability to um, guarantee things will work. Um, but yeah, you remember last time, it's quite a while ago, I had downloaded this uh, demo application by the name of Hello Phoenix. Um, and I honestly forget where I left off with this. So we're going to try to pick it up from the guides, um, which would be the same place as if I were to hit this big old button that says see the guides. So um, let's go there. Uh, so I think I did install all the dependencies that are necessary, such as Elixir, Erlang, Hex, and Phoenix Archive. I think I got that all. Um, we can run Mix Phoenix New to bootstrap a Phoenix application in the same way that you, with Rails, would just like say Rails New or whatever the word is. I forget the syntax. Um, but it will accept either a relative path or absolute path as to where you want to put your new project. Um, note on Brunch. Phoenix will use Brunch for asset management. Um, it uses NPM, not Mix. Um, so this is just for assets. We're still using Brunch. Um, if you don't want that at all, if you don't want to use Brunch at all, just pass no Brunch when you're creating a new project. Um, but I assume that if this is the demo recommended way of doing things, that static assets could probably still be supplied using NPF because they are static and that code's not going to change very frequently. And you always have this option for greater stability, I assume, um, to use uh, this flag or parameter. Okay, so... Um, I've already done this, mix phoenix new hello phoenix, uh, generates the directory, and when it's done, it asks if we want to install our dependencies for us. I'm pretty sure I did all this um, after my last stream, if not during it, and uh, assumes that PostgreSQL is installed. I think I have PostgreSQL 9.1 up and running on this machine, cd mix ecto.create. I think I've already done this as well. Um, this is the first time I ask you to also install rebar. Well, let's let's verify. What happens if I issue this twice? Um, actually, let's assume that I've already done it because I'm pretty sure I have. I know I did install Postgres 9.1 or Postgres 9 of some sort. Let's try to run the server. Um, oh, we need newer dependencies. Uh, yeah, let's go update our dependencies. Now, Mix itself is not using NPM as its library manager, so this, in my opinion, is going to be safer. Um, cannot download metadata. Okay, that's unfortunate. Um, Failed connect to address repo hex pm. 
Let's give that another go. Okay, so that did successfully update uh, to 15. Let's try this again. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Um, it says I did... Oh, I created hex 15. Let's try to install that, I suppose. Would that be a sensible thing to do? Um, yeah, mix is apparently the equivalent of NPM um, used by uh, the Phoenix framework, if not by Elixir itself. I don't think Elixir has that sort of thing. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know whether it's Phoenix or Elixir that uses mix. Uh, let's see. Update hex. Um, mm -hmm. Is this one of those deals where I have to like log in again in order to get all my latest dependencies? Um, okay, that's unfortunate. Here, let's go back up a directory. No, I don't want to purge this directory, but because I've already created the database. I'm pretty sure. Uh, when it's done, it asks if it wants to install dependencies. We said yes. Um, mm -hmm. Could do this in interactive elixir with IEX. Um, Oh, wait. Oh, IEX and then mix. So mix is still the command being run here. Um, yes, but really update it this time. Um, I shouldn't have to do sudo. This should not be necessary. Um... That's unfortunate. Okay, do I have to like re log in um, for my environment to reload or something silly like that? Let's try this. Mix Phoenix. Nope. So, just for clarity's sake, we require hex greater or equal to 14, but I have 13 too. Um, let's go in and purge some stuff. Um, so yeah, go get the latest hex. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, so what I'm gonna do now uh, is just start purging stuff left and right. Because apparently some of that was installed with other user permissions and all right clear um, Phoenix oh, I'm sorry now I want to go through the tutorial steps as recommended uh, and see just how badly I butchered it okay so I have to reinstall mix that's okay why not do a ch mod um, because I don't want to try goofing around with that. I'd rather reinstall stuff. Ideally, I would have set up a container for all of this, but I didn't bother. Um, so how did I install this the first time? We've already installed Elixir. Um, in Erlang and so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> no, I, I just think my entire installation's borked and I need to start over. That's the reason. Sorry if that sounds uh, too pessimistic. Also because I don't think it was that hard to get things installed in the first place. 
if it's this hard to install things, then um, then we got some problems. Okay, so here's the command to install hex. Uh, unfortunately, I'm also trying to like entertain an audience while reading through this. And I did not do a proof of concept before this because I was intending to do something different today. That's okay. Um, Elixir. I know I installed Elixir, but you know, let's verify the installation. No sense in keeping, uh, skipping any steps. Erlang Solutions repo. I've already done this. Okay. Now yeah, we've added that sudo apt get update. And then install the Erlang OTP platform. And then install Elixir. Um. Wait, is that for a source installation? Uh, apparently whatever I've done, I don't need this um, repository. Uh, so... Um, update db to locate where I put the file locate this repository um, oh no I, I have installed this before uh, same exact thing um, ESL Erlang conflicts with these other Erlangs whatever I think at least I have some version of Erlang installed I've got some version of Elixir installed it's the latest version so I think I've successfully installed Erlang and Elixir at this point. Um, not entirely sure I've got uh, exactly what I need set up, but it's okay. Um, I can actually reinstall to just verify the sanity of that installation. And then we source our profile. And now if I try to use the mix command, task phoenix new cannot be found. I still borked something in my installation. Um, what have I done wrong? Yeah, mix archive install. Um, people are have I don't okay this is anything but methodological methodology is go to Google use the first result no um, we're at least going to check out the second result before we go too far um, you have not installed the Phoenix templates Okay. At least there's somewhat of an explanation. Uh, yeah. Let's take the Phoenix templates. There we go. Fetch and install dependencies. Um, local mix local dot hex to get the latest uh, hex. Uh, Yep, let's get version 15. Failed to execute. Okay. Oh, so apparently I did things out of order. And then pull the archive. Okay, so I'm pulling the archive now. Yes, go replace stuff. Cool. Now mix Hello Phoenix. Yes. 
Um, quit, 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 abort. Let's remove Hello Phoenix, recreate it. There we go. Fetch and install the dependencies. I'm just getting a sane installation. Node.js is an optional dependency. Well, thank goodness I don't see Node.js here. Um, oh, because they use brunch for stuff. Uh, yeah, like they were saying in the tutorial. But yeah, thanks for helping me advance through this. Um, all right. CD hello Phoenix. Mix the server. I could also do this inside Interactive Elixir. Before moving on, um, before starting your server, create the database instance, which I'm pretty sure I've already done. Um, shall I install rebar? Apparently I've not done this. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's install rebar to hook up the application to the database. Um, database, again, is going to be a Postgres 9.1 database, which I'll probably have some permissions issue with. Um, yeah, YRL is a format, I think, in Rails and elsewhere for defining um, XML, or not XML, but defining a configuration file for, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of YML, yet another markup language. No, the, I'm thinking of YAML is yet another markup language. YML, I think, is used for defining a Rails database configuration. Anyway, YRL here must be um, used for um, configuring how your application connects to a database. Oh, um, yeah, I could do... No, I'm actually... Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah, if I were to do this without Ecto, without Brunch, I could get an application up and running faster. I just issued mix phoenix.new and then hello underscore phoenix is my directory name. Um, yeah. So, I'm pretty sure... Uh, wait, how is Postgres not running? Postgres is definitely doing something. Um, but okay. I could do apparently no Ecto if I want to get this working faster. Oh, it's a parser gen- right. Okay. So, yeah, I got those uh, confused. That's cool. Um... Yeah, let's scrap Hello Phoenix, clear, and this time, just in the interest of getting something up and running as quickly as possible, no Ecto. Um, so do this without a database, basically. Um, I assume that's what no Ecto is for. <laughs> I'm probably assuming far too much. Um... Please take a look at this list and make sure you have the things installed. Yeah, the up and running guide does mention Postgres. I think this is what I missed the other day, is install the dependencies. Um, by default, it accepts requests to import 4000. Um, you know, I should probably go into my Rails, uh, not my Rails, and you should probably go into my, what's the reverse proxy server? Reverse proxy server has a name. I know because I've been there. I've looked at this. <sighs> what was the name of the reverse proxy server that we used for the Leechess application? Um, Nginx. Locate. Um, locate nginx.conf. Yeah, it's Etsy nginx nginx.conf sudo vim etsy nginx nginx.conf um, then down here where I'm saying by default actually not even by default I thought I had something here for relay chess apparently not oh okay here we go so if you go into the name of relay chess.com or relay chess.moo.com 
it redirects you to the server of port 8080. Um, so let's grab some lines and duplicate these. Um, Y20-ish lines of code. Okay. And then set up over here. I don't even know what I want to call this. Um, yeah, I may need some sort of name for it. Hello Phoenix.com. Um, now the only reason I'm creating actually this isn't going to be too helpful um, whatever let's put it there uh, doesn't really matter where I put that um, but the key is that it's going to be redirecting to port 4000 um, so that if people, for whatever reason, wanted to navigate to my IP address using this host name, uh, they would get that. So now I could go over to um, my hosts file in Notepad. Um, and just put in there hellophoenix.com. Got to elevate privileges for Notepad to write that. Um, yeah, no, I guess the point is that I might want to expose it. Um, the other point is that I'm not exactly running locally. Uh, my browser is on a different machine than... Um, okay, so we see this does navigate. <laughs> doesn't... Ex oh. My bad. I forgot I need to reload. Uh, uh, reload engine x dot service. Okay. So yeah, the point would just be if I want to expose this and not have to type in colon 4000 every time I navigate there. I mean, I could do that. I could do, like, hello phoenix port 4000. Oh, that's interesting. I forgot. Um, anyway. Yeah, I, obviously I don't have the application up and running, so I'm going to get a connection refused error. Plus I also probably have a firewall issue in the middle. Uh, so I would need to actually do like links localhost port 4000. And I was just going to say they can't connect. Um, again, because there's probably a firewall in the way. Uh, so we've created Hello Phoenix. Um, but yeah, attempting to expose it across my network in a way that would emulate how you would normally install a web application and expose it. Um, so we've created the Hello Phoenix um, directory, this skeleton code. Um, dependencies have been installed. And then to actually run the server, it just be run the server like this, mix phoenix.server. Um, I don't know if that's an actual domain. Uh, I've just added it to my hosts file as a convenience to myself. I could always change it to be something else. Um, yeah, obviously I don't own hellophoenix.com at the moment. Um, uh, but I just did put hellophoenix.com into my hosts file. So my browser will navigate to my server, which is running other web servers on it. And um, the reverse proxy server will pick the correct one. Um, no, okay, that 
I was trying to demonstrate a proof of concept here. Okay. So, this is interesting. Um, <laughs> this is showing that I did something really confusing in how, wait, can I force refresh? Like, how did it even... I am impressed. So, what this is, is basically Nginx is attempting to redirect to my uh, Hello Phoenix application, but Apache is having none of that and is still serving up the redirect. Okay, well, we're just going to assume that I set up everything right with Apache and with Nginx, and we just got here. And that the reverse proxy itself resolved perfectly, and there wasn't any issue with that. Okay, cool. So we got Phoenix Framework. People who make these languages love to show you. Just type a couple commands. You got a simple website, all your skeleton code exactly how you want it. Um, and yeah, in this case, that'd be right. That the dependencies. Um, wasn't too hard, and you got some good skeleton code you can change. Um, yeah, I think, and I think I've moved Apache to always run on port 8080. Um, so in theory, it shouldn't conflict with Nginx, which is running on port 80. Um, I'm pretty sure I did that, although somehow I screwed it up. Um, but the idea is that I still want to be able to have um, uh, virtual hosts and so forth uh, under Apache. Um, uh, but I want uh, a reverse proxy server to be listening on port 80, and I don't want to go through all the BS that is necessary to um, make uh, Apache do the same things that Nginx does. Um, I mean, it's all doable, but uh, since I'm running the LeeChess application, and since I have a uh, LeeChess configuration that's based on Nginx, that's what my public-facing server should be using. Um, but anyway. Yeah, welcome to Phoenix. So we got some guides here. Oh, this just takes us back, yeah, to the Phoenix Framework webpage. Um, uh, again, a lot of this is quite similar to how Rails works, um, but Rails is not functional programming based. And so I can consider this somewhat of a hybrid between Rails and uh, Scala. Um, but yeah, these all direct to public pages. Um, there's a get started link. Uh, all these direct outside of your server. Um, but it just shows you that you can get a hello page uh, up and running. Uh, you know, Elixir is functional programming for people that are coming from Ruby. Right. And that uh, Phoenix is the rails of Elixir. Right. Yeah, that's, um, in my mind, that's the best analogy. Is that um, I never really bought into Ruby uh, in terms of Ruby on Rails. Ruby's great as um, its own language for the tasks you'd want to use that sort of language for but I wouldn't think it suitable for writing a full-scale web server application. I think Elixir, um, as well as uh, Phoenix, makes a great deal of sense for writing enterprise applications that run on web servers, because you want those strong typed guarantees. You want all the benefits that come with functional programming. Um, in particular, uh, the fact that you're doing functional programming means you don't have to deal with immutability. 
And so I never really bought into Ruby on Rails, but this is something I could buy into. Um, yeah. Well, I, goodness, I mean, it's funny. These people who have built all their startups um, on Rails, they need Rails developers, right? Okay, well, uh, are they looking for Rails 3 developers? Are they looking for Rails 4 developers? All the developers who work with Rails 3 will tell you there's all these advantages to moving to Rails 4. And it's okay, management gets kind of lost in all the details, basically, and they'll think, oh, well, why would I choose this Phoenix framework thing? Am I going to have the same issues after I migrate from Rails 3 to Rails 4? And then after I go from Rails 4 over to Phoenix framework 1, how do I know I'm not going to see another problem trying to migrate to Phoenix framework 2? And I'm like, guys, the point is that Rails, uh, they had to keep changing their library um, to basically a lot changed between Rails 3 and 4. Um, and if functional programming at its core is going to change from Phoenix Framework 1 to 2, if ever there is a 2, um, you know, that's going to be a pretty radical change in how programs work. Um, whereas nobody could really explain to you, like, how does Rails 3 work? How does Rails 4 work? They, they just do. And look at me, I can type in a command and get a program up and running quickly, and isn't that great? Well, okay, now we did this with Phoenix Framework. But the point is that functional programming is not going to change overnight, the same way that Rails 3 and 4 changed. Uh, overnight's a bit of a... Um, uh, it's not the right term to use. Yeah. Right. And I I would tend to think that for Phoenix Framework is going to be a heck of a lot more stable than the Rails API. Um, I'm not saying that the Rails API itself is unstable, or and there are significant differences, and that you're not going to see that same sort of tearing. If you're starting with a functional programming basis, which basically puts all kinds of constraints in place on the language itself, that doesn't allow you to F things up to the point of no return, the way that maybe you could have in Rails 3, I don't know. I'm not a Rails developer, but yeah, this is something I could buy into, I think. Um, so, let's kill that app. Can we just quit, return, kill, kill, kill? Okay, there we go. It's dead. I killed it. Yeah, start with Haskell. Uh, I don't know, is there like, does Haskell do web applications? Um, um, Relay, Chess, and Haskell. <laughs> ah. Um, so, is there anything more? Really primitive getting started oh right database bindings well whatever whatever I'll deal with that offline we don't need to weigh everybody down here with the details of binding a database and I mean I've done that in rails before I've helped a rails developer do database bindings and troubleshoot all that um, even though I'm not a rails developer uh, Anyway, um, does Haskell do web apps? Uh, yes, do web, or yes, odd web. Uh, Spock Lee. <laughs> uh, oh, that's cool. I, I've not heard of yes, odd web. I've not heard of Spock Lee. I've heard of something like uh, Hapstack. Yeah. Snap framework, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but are there any Haskell developers? Uh, no, that's just mean. Of course there are. Um, there are developers for any language out there, and it's a good language. Um, yeah, no, I'm definitely not changing that. 
Sorry. <laughs> I'm not trying to subvert anything. Uh, FYI, um, there had been some discussion about a proper chat server service, whatever, for uh, Leechess recently. And then they ended up kicking the can down the road a little bit further because there's other things to work on. But um, I'm trying to remember, there was one slight change they made to how chat works on Leechess. And I'm not remembering it, and it bugs me. But, yeah. Oh, right, no, I forgot. They added a Discord server basically acknowledging that their own chat services and their own forums are kind of limited. And so, yeah, they're... Even Leechess is embracing Discord at this point, saying, like, this is the right way to go, because implementing a chat service is difficult. Um, so, just for what that's worth. Yeah, no, they actually made one. Uh, I don't know why, because it's... I mean, you got people around the world talking to one another. Um, oh, the other thing that's interesting, I hadn't thought about this, is that the... Uh, what am I thinking of? The online Go server has a chat room, and they just open-sourced their user interface. So, in theory, you could copy that user interface and write your own backend for it and you'd have a working chat server but what's the point yeah we're gonna beat them to having a proper full scale full stack whatever the proper term is for an integrated chat service and then we're gonna develop integrations for Google Plus Facebook Twitter no no I'm kidding I'm not going to do any of that, um, but I don't expect people are going to use the chat service as much as we think they might. Um, game chat, in-game chat, there's value too. Um, anyway, did I get through this? Um, mix ecto create, npm install for brunch, and so on and so forth. You can rerun the generator with the no brunch option. Accepts things. Okay, spiffy. If you see this above, congratulations, you have a working application. Try accessing it. Application's running in an interactive Elixir session. Oh, to stop it, we hit Control C twice, just as we would normally stop interactive Elixir. The next step is customizing the application to give a bit of a sense as to how Phoenix app was put together. I mean, yeah, the taxonomy of a web application. Exciting stuff, guys. All right, so. Yeah, use TypeScript. Actually, Leechus is increasingly moving to TypeScript. Um, and uh, developers are bemoaning the fact that they didn't do this, take this seriously earlier in terms of TypeScript. So. Um, yeah, forthcoming is a newer version of Scala Chess, not Scala Chess, of, um, Chess Ground. I think we're moving, migrating to Chess Ground version 6 using TypeScript. Um, but yeah, TypeScripting in general is allowing for a lot more powerful, uh, constructs. Um, Ramda JS. <laughs> um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to try to get him to buy into Elm or PureScript. TypeScript has a large following. Um, and maybe ping him about it. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure why um why TypeScript and not Elm. Elm might be something he'd be more interested in doing, honestly. Um, just, I don't know. Um, our task for this guy is to add two new pages to Phoenix. One will be a purely static page, and the other will take path this and pass it through as a template for display. 
I mean, goodness, this is going to be the same thing that I read about Rails. I'm not a Rails developer. I have read tutorials about how Rails works, and I was just so unimpressed by it. I mean, it's great that they have this taxonomy, but um, the taxonomy itself did not convince me that the approach would, had any merit. Um, but, yeah, since we're using a functional programming language, I have a vastly different opinion here. Um, all right, so, you know, this build, config, dependencies, lib, private, test, and web. Most of our work will be in the web directory. Okay, so they call it web instead of app. That's whatever, I don't really care. Um, because, I mean, I actually forget if Rails calls that app or if they call it something else. Scala calls that. I'm oh, sorry, Leech us, uh, uh, calls this, um, they have a separate divisions for app versus modules. Um, whereas here they have dependencies in web. And that's okay. Web actually makes some more sense than app because you can't have an app directory inside an application. I mean, what does that mean? Most of our work in this guide will be in the web directory, which looks like this. We've got channels, controllers, models, static content, templates, views, and so forth. Now, what confuses me already is why static content is hosted inside web and not its own thing. But, um, so... All the files which are currently in controller templates and views are there to create the welcome to Phoenix. Yeah, I get that. I get the distinction. That's very nice. You place assets into web slash static and the source are built into respective app.js. Oh, okay. And private slash static. Um, app. Why app? Other than just for lack of a better name. Well, no, I guess this is the entire compiled CSS in one file or something. Uh, all of our application static assets. Oh, so there must have been some static assets. In fact, here are our static assets for the entire app and the JavaScript for the entire app. And then there's private static as well, which I assume is um, used better somehow. The lib directory contains libraries. <laughs> um, our application's endpoint is it the application name slash endpoint dot ex and our application file, which starts the application and its supervision tree, is the application name dot ex. Okay. That's useful to know. Um, I assume repo was automatically generated based on the ecto configuration that set all that up. But anyway, uh, unlike the web directory, Phoenix won't recompile files inside of lib when there's a new web request. This is uh, an intentional uh, distinction. Um, provides a convention. Yeah, actually, yeah, this is a useful convention uh, that allows us to define state within the application. The web directory contains anything whose state lasts for the duration of a web request. The lib directory contains shared modules and anything that needs to manage state outside the duration of a web request. Okay. Um, They won't recompile files inside of lib when there's a new web request. When do you recompile files inside of lib? I guess as needed. Anyway, um, new route. Uh, probably just when you like start or stop the server would be when um, files in lib get compiled. But Anyway, that's the convention. Um, routes map all those. Yeah, who doesn't know what a route is? Go look it up. No, I'm not intending to be facetious or 
um, unhelpful like that. But uh, if you don't know what a route is, watching this video, this stream is not going to help you. Um, let's add a new route that redirects to the index um, action of the new hello controller. Again, I've done, I've seen all this done in Rails. I may have even done some of this myself. Um, and then just rapidly lost interest in Ruby on Rails because I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, controllers are Elixir modules and actions are Elixir, Elixir functions defined in the controllers. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, and okay, got it. A uh, new view. Views have important jobs to render templates and act as a presentation layer for use in a template. Functions which perform this transformation should go into a view. Got it. Been there, done something quite similar actually with Java and struts, um, believe it or not. That's okay. A new template. Templates are just that, templates into which data can be rendered. Uh, the templating engine is embedded Elixir, which is EEX. Um, yeah, I've seen this done in Rails. Uh, another new page. Let's add another uh, pass in a piece in the URL, label it as a messenger, and pass it through the controller. So our template uh, messenger can say hello. Okay. Um, so here we have a route which reuses the hello controller and a new show action. Yeah, and somehow what most interests me here is just like how parameters are passed through um, in the route. So let's see. Um, pipe through browser, use the default browser stack. Oh, okay, so this defines a pipe. Um, so your route will initially go through the browser stack, and then based on which case you match here, uh, direct to the index, direct to the um, hello controller, or if you have a messenger parameter, direct to the hello controller and call the show um, function. Put the atom messenger inside the path. Um, and Phoenix will take whatever values that appears in that position in the URL. Oh, okay, so that's URL positioned. Interesting. Um, I guess that makes some sense. New action. So, yeah, I get that, I get that new template so we have to be able to pass um, from our controller um, data into the show action of uh, I'm sorry we're calling the show action of the controller we're passing in I've lost track already wow oh I'm sorry this is a new action uh, this is an action of the controller parameter. Um, uh, the params will always be strings, and the equal sign does not represent assignment, but is instead a pattern match assertion. Well, that's useful to know. Um, the template says. Um, right. Um, because the way we implemented this action is to call the new code in the template. The template will accept um, the messenger parameter. I probably have this backwards. This is what the template should look like. Okay, actually that makes sense that you would put divs inside your template and then you could embed your template inside your controller. 
um, which is what we're doing here. We're, we're saying render show.html, um, the template show.html. Um, actually, yeah, where's the nuance here? Is this in our route where we're defining where our template is? What's our template name? Yeah, so this is, oh, show.html.eex. But in order to render that template, um, we don't reference it by .eex. We just reference, this is the uh, resulting file that I need to produce. And that the render command finds that I have a template by that name, as opposed to I have a static asset by that name. So render does some kind of heavy lifting there to figure out, am I using a template or not? Although it should, I guess maybe you'd always use render if you have a template and probably use something else if you have a static asset. Um, but yeah, cool. Whatever you put after hello, we'll put in up here there as your messenger. All right, where's the next part of the tutorial? Because I'm pretty sure I get that. Um, adding pages, routing probably works exactly the same way that routing works elsewhere. Um, actually, no. No. We're using functional programming so we can define a pipeline. So this gives us, um, instead of having to code all this, um, having to code a class, a controller class, which extends and has all this aspect-oriented programming, uh, here you're able to define the pipeline which says all the controllers to apply in sequence. Uh, so you don't have a controller which is security enabled, which is password enabled, which is, I don't know. You have um, a pipeline and you can not have to worry about um, your developers having to remember to declare that every one of their controllers needs to be secured. You don't have to define a configuration file somewhere saying, that uh, all my things should be secured. Instead, you define right in the pipeline how the security and other aspects would work. Although I'm sure there's other ways to configure some of that, but maybe there aren't. Maybe I'm making that up. But either way, this is not repeating yourself as far as I know. This seems pretty straightforward. Um, I'm actually curious now. Um, yeah, how would something like a security layer work with this sort of approach? Because um, then you might have the ability to have some things that are secured and some things that don't necessarily need the same level of security. And I'm not sure what you'd need to do with um, pipelining with regard to that. Um, Oh, but also having a pipeline means that you don't have enormous classes that have all these attributes in them. It means that each individual uh, plug in this pipeline um, can itself be really simple, easily tested, unit tested, and then integration tested. Um, you can define all kinds of tests for what if I wanted to just define, or if, what if I want to test uh, fetch flash with all the other plugs? What if I want to test it by itself? What if I want to test it in a chain with some other things? You could define tests for every one of those combinations if you wanted to. If you somehow just didn't trust the functional programming aspect of this application. Um, yeah, I guess this does get a bit advanced. Um, and this is where, again, a person looking at this from a business point of view might not see much value in being able to test things because gosh testing takes time and nobody got time for that um, you just have to hire developers who know what they're doing um, which you do still have to do that but instead of putting all the blame on the developers when things go wrong um, now you can start to put blame on the sysadmins or whatever I'm kidding um, Mix Phoenix routes shows uh, the routes um, for the index and show are defined. 
I'm running a mixed Phoenix routes. Uh, so we have all the routes except the delete request to for the delete action. Um, or to the delete action. Well, that's interesting. Um, resources, posts, post controller, l limiting the scope to just index and show. Interesting. Um, so for users, you could let's say I'm going to enable all these things on a post controller, on a user controller. I assume a user controller extends a post controller, but, uh, or there is some, no, we don't, anyway. The fact that these are both controllers does not mean that you have to enable all these actions for each controller. You can just limit um, these uh, visibility of certain functions to uh, just index and show here. Now, am I writing a configuration file to mix this, or am I? Um, hmm, am I typing a command somewhere? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Resources, I think, is a command to create a resource. Um, Interesting. So this is like the syntactic sugar for automatically creating um, handling of this and then creating the controller and creating just these two. I see. So yeah, I've seen people do clever things with uh, Rails as well. And this is just syntactic sugar for creating things quickly, which is good. Uh, path helpers, um, dynamically defined on the route or helpers module for an individual application. Um, it's a mouthful. Let's see it in action. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm a bit confused. That's okay. Path helpers. Uh, significant because we can change the page path function in a template to link to our application route. Oh, okay, so this is a way of sharing libraries across controllers and paths and so forth. Um, that's clever. I don't suppose that I'll be using that all the time. Um, nested resources, so you can do some fancy stuff. Is basically, um, huh, that's clever. Resources, users, user controller, resources, posts, post controller um, would allow you to nest resources inside a Phoenix router. Um, the user can create many posts, and an individual post belongs to only one user. Um, oh, so you would have users, and then under that, under your path, you would have posts. That's cool. Um, so you, uh, you can end up with interesting uh, chains, I guess, here. That's an interesting way to generate. You don't have to manually type out every one of these. Um, you're able to nest routes within each other. That's cool. If we add a key value pair to the end of the function call, let's add it to the string. Okay, and you have scoped routes. Um, again, functional programming to the rescue where you're able to um, filter things up front. Um, let's 
Scope Admin. Huh. How does this work? Slash admin slash reviews. We choose this with a scoped route that sets a path option to admin. Let's not nest this inside of any other scopes. Um, oh, wow. That's spiffy. Um, okay, so you can do all this fancy stuff with routes, and that just never ends, basically. Remember in the overguide where we described plugs as being stacked and executable in predetermined order like a pipeline? Now we're going to take a closer look at how these plug stacks work in the router. Okay, see this kind of background would have been a little bit nice to present up front instead of presenting an example and an example and an example. But I'm really being picky at this point. Uh, endpoint plugs. I mean, yeah, we get that idea that some things are... Um, uh, serving static assets, uh, logging requests, like all these things sound functional. Um, uh, log request, enable code, reloading for all entries in the web directory, parsers. Uh, okay, well, let's deal with some of the more simple of these. Um, finds two other pipelines default by default browser and API uh, router will invoke these after it matches a route and the browser pipeline prepares for routes which render to a browser <laughs> okay well that's pretty straightforward um, API only defines um, accepts um, JSON that's cool Um, see so yeah, how this defines the request format. Somebody has to request HTML. Um, that's cool. Those are a lot of words bunched up together. Let's take a look at some examples to untangle their meaning. See, so yeah, I appreciate this, where they give the more technical explanation up front. Although... <laughs> Again, being picky, it'd be nice to see things explained in simple terms, then in more specific terms, and then in these most specific terms, looking at an example. Um, but who am I to criticize? I didn't write this language. Um, so yeah. Define for a browser pipeline. Uh, actually, we're going to use the built-in browser pipeline, saying that we're only going to accept HTML uh, requests um, protect from forgery, puts uh, some secure browser headers. Um, then we got the API, which only accepts JSON. Yeah, so other scopes may use custom stacks. Hmm. Anyway. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to use the browser stack or pipeline. You don't have to use the API. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, those are pipelines. You could choose to define your own stack saying the I'm going to pipe things through. Oh. Well, that's cool. You can define a scope and then pipe it through the API here. This is how you achieve the don't repeat yourself nature that I was just discussing like five minutes ago. So you can define a pipeline and then in each scope reference the pipeline and then pass through to your stuff. That's just pretty cool. Um, whenever the server accepts a request, I'll always go through the all requests will f always first pass through the plugs in our endpoint, after which it will attempt to match on the path in HTTP verb. Um, okay, so yeah, we already talked about the nature of endpoints and how an endpoint would be selected. 
Um, and if you fail to match on the endpoint, this is saying then it'll try to find uh, something matching on the half, the HTTP verb. Um, which I guess would just be static content at that point. If we know our application only renders views for the browser, we can simplify our router quite a bit by removing the API stuff. Well, duh. Um, yeah. For scope, for a top level scope, pipe through the browser. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry, for this other scope, then pipe through the API, but you could remove all the API stuff. See, this would have been a good would have been a good example to follow with, but who am I to criticize? Uh, removing all scopes forces the router to invoke the, um, the browser pipeline on all routes. So if you have no scopes to find, um, yeah, it's just gonna use the browser pipeline for everything. That's cool. Let's stretch these ideas out a little bit more. What if we want something that pipes through both browser and or one more custom pipelines? We simply pipe through a list of pipelines. Oh, wow. You can actually define your list of pipelines as an actual list, as opposed to saying pipe through X, pipe through Y, pipe through Z, and so forth. You just define all your your stack to here directly. Okay, so now the next question is, in the spirit of don't repeat yourself, can you define a macro for defining um, the list of pipelines and then import that list of pipelines? I mean, let's see, can we go deeper? And then can you define a macro for something that allows you to use that macro extensively somehow and uh, anyway allows you to create your own custom pipelines yeah I mean we've seen we saw this example far earlier although now it actually makes sense because you're attempting to explain it before showing an example but yes yes you can define your own pipelines great um, Wait, so what's the point of having two pipelines here? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like not like we're using the browser pipeline anywhere in this example, but you could have two. That's the point. Channel routes. They're very exciting. Oh, okay. Um, so again, we're not talking about, um, a specific implementation that's like socket based or something we're talking about functionality <laughs> I assumed that you are just vacuuming the keyboard um, and if something worse than that had happened um, there wouldn't be anything I could do about it anyhow uh, so I had hoped for the best and it looks like my hope uh, was rewarded but, um, yeah, vacuuming the keyboard while it's on. Bold move. I just. It's probably okay. Worst happens, you just have to buy a new keyboard. But, anyway. Channels are a very exciting real-time component to the Phoenix framework. They allow you to handle incoming and outgoing messages broadcast over a socket for a given topic. Channel routes then need to match the requests by socket and topic in order to dispatch to the correct channel. I mean, the Lee Chess framework has done tons of stuff like that. Okay, good. That car horn stopped uh, beeping. Yeah, that's okay. They can have it. Um. So we must mount the socket handlers um, in the endpoint. And this will define oh, how to handle connections through the socket. So we are going to use the word socket. 
even though we're not bound to a particular socket implementation, um, we're doing things with functional programming as opposed to imperatives. So um, there could be multiple ways that you define how a socket works, I guess, but whatever. Um, the channel three macro to define our channel routes. Well, yeah. I mean, so we're going to put a controller here for how to handle. Well, they use the word handler. Because the controller is actually the thing that we're adding. This is the endpoint controller. And we're defining a handler um, for a socket. Um, which apparently is a socket path uh, in the way it's specified here. But topics are just string identifiers and so on and so forth. Um, each socket can handle requests from multiple channels. Um, okay, if you say so. That makes sense. I mean, you wouldn't want to limit a socket to just one particular um, channel, because then you'd have to have one socket per channel, uh, which could be expensive. And uh, Phoenix abstracts the socket transport layer. That's the thing I was trying to say. It abstracts the socket transport layer and includes two transport mechanisms, either web sockets or long polling. Um, <coughs> If you want to require it to be done via WebSocket or require it to be done via long polling, you can define it that way, but you're not going to be forced to. Um, oh no! Don't vacuum a mouse pad. Uh, okay, good to know. Gosh. I. Interesting. Yeah. That's perhaps the most profound lesson uh, of today's um, discovery here. Just don't vacuum a mouse pad. Uh, so that's routing. Um, I have a sense that every one of these things is going to be just in as in-depth as the routing page we were just looking at. Um, so, yeah, this is... This is really detailed, useful stuff. Huh. Okay, at least you have no pet hair inside your keyboard, so that's fortunate. Um, so, yeah, this is great. Um, so, yeah, I think the next step, since this is not really a tutorial, I mean, this is a guide to what is a route, what is a plug, what is a controller, what is a view, what's a template, what's a channel, what's an ecto model. Um, in terms of what I want to do right now, I think I want to read through this plug um, because I see the scroll bar is only this high. Like, if the scroll bar were a lot smaller, I would be afraid of reading this page. But this looks manageable. So I want to get through plug, I want to get through ecto model, and since I don't really have an objective other than just get a familiarity with Phoenix framework, um, I think those are my two objectives here. It's just read the plug page, read the ecto model page, um, and then I have some... I don't have any particular project in mind, no. If I had one in mind, um, that might be a next thing to approach. Um, honestly, my objective is more just getting a basic familiarity with some of this. Um, so earlier today, my goal was um, to make some progress with the, uh, what was that thing I just installed? Um, I'm drawing a blank on what its name was but the application which allows you to script for GUI applications. That was my original goal. Um, and now my goal is just to get a little bit more familiar with Phoenix Framework. I already did get the Hello Phoenix application up and running. That was great. Um, 
And I just want a little bit more reading of uh, how plugs and ecto models work. There's not going to be anything surprising here. Um, and then just let that set in the back of my mind until I have a project um, where it would be useful to do this. And, um, and um, the project that I'm interested in working on. And perhaps there will be more advances in Phoenix Framework by the time that happens too. But like I said, this language seems pretty solid. Um, I really like the functional programming aspect of it. And it seems much more accessible than Scala. So there's that. <laughs> um, so plug lives at the heart of the HTTP layer and Phoenix puts plug front and center. They interact with plugs at every step of the connection lifecycle and the core Phoenix components such as endpoints, routers, and controllers internally are implemented as plugs. Um, plugs a specification for composable modules. Oh goodness, this is actually, this reminds me, the way they specify this, like saying plug is a specification for composable modules in between web applications, etc., etc. It goes on here. The sort of technical mathematical description is something that seems more familiar to Spring. I read a book called Spring in Action um, and it talks about how to do aspect oriented programming and it talks about how um, whatever the key term is there, these um, it's like a container, it's a lightweight container for dependency injection, whatever the key term they used in Spring was. Um, it's a very mathematical description there as well. And this um, seems seems to harken back a bit, just in its very computer science-y way of describing this. It's very abstract. Um, so it's a specification for a composable module in between web applications, also an abstraction layer for connection adapters of web servers. Basic idea is to unify the concept of connection that we operate on. This differentiate the difference ah, I can speak. This differs from other HTTP middleware layers such as Rack, where the request and response are separated in the middleware stack. Um, so you can have function plugs and module plugs. Function plug, uh, in order to act as a plug, a function simply needs to accept a connection struct uh, structure um, and options. It also needs to return the connection struct. Any function that meets these criteria will do. Uh, for example, put headers, connection key values, reduce uh, across key values using connection and function um, and for connection call plug uh, connection put response header with the connection uh, with the key to string comma v. Um, pretty simple. Oh, I'm sorry this is a parameter list. So this is reduce for this set of parameters, key values, connection, function, and connection. I'm not sure why connection specified twice. Um, anyhow, call this function here, or evaluate this function, put response header for the connection parameter um, for and so on and so forth. So I'm confused still why connection is listed here twice. Um, maybe that's something I can simply overlook and be okay with it. Um, so this just got through saying that in order to act as a plug, functionally, function simply needs to accept a connection struct and options. It also needs to return the connection struct. 
Well, put response header is going to evaluate. Maybe this is the return type is these four values. That doesn't seem right. I mean, what else would it mean? Yeah, I'm confused about some of the syntax there. I'll have to read up more about it. Uh, so how we can propose a series of transformations on our connection in Phoenix. Uh, to find a module, use um, use Hello Phoenix Web and the controller. Um, I'm getting hungry and or exhausted here. We saw the syntax on the previous page. Um, using Hello Phoenix Web, using the built-in controller, um, and don't want to say aspect because aspect is not the word they use. Um, scope is also not correct. Yeah, we want to use Hello Phoenix Web um, as well as just the built-in controller. Um, so we put some headers on uh, our input, um, such as uh, using gzip constant encoding and such as maximum age is this, and we um, apply the bare.html um, transformation. Um, so these are both function plugs, right? How can that be? Like here, this is a function that clearly satisfies that. Oh, this is saying this is how we use them to compose a series of transformations on our connection. So it's implicit that um, you have the connection if you're able to call put headers. Um, put headers accepts a connection and accepts key values. And I guess somehow reduce here just in the syntactic sugar. I'm not sure if this is saying we're going to return all of these things or if it's just saying we're going to accept a key value, accept a connection, and return a function and a connection, which would be strange. I don't know why you would do that. But maybe it's just saying we're just going to return the connection as well as the original connection. And we're going to return just all of these things. That's OK. By abiding by the plug contract, uh, put headers to, put layout to, and even action to, turn an application request into a series of explicit transformations. It doesn't stop there. To see how effective this is, imagine a scenario where we needed to check a series of conditions uh, without a plug, you would end up with arrow code, with, which Jeff Atwood, um, he writes the blog Coding Horror, he's involved with the Discourse project, he heavily recommends against this anti-pattern of arrow code, um, because that just gets unwieldy, and you're ending up repeating yourself quite often, and you're ending up repeating yourself quite often when you do things this way. I joke. Notice how just a few steps of authentication, yeah. I mean, Ruby tries to hide this complexity um, by requiring you to repeat yourself every time you define your controller and define your aspects and so on and so forth. Here, um, this doesn't make any attempt to hide things. Like in the class type, we're not attempting to hide that this is a secured controller. No. You have to be explicit about what plugs you're using. Um, I guess that makes it a little trickier to... Um, yeah, maybe it does. But I think functional programming is a reasonable way to decompose things. Um, 
as opposed to doing things by extension or composition. I mean, here when we're doing things by composition, it's very functional and you know uh, what composes what and what's composed of what. Um, whereas extension, extensibility, is an interesting uh, proposition. I just read just a couple days ago that the time at which you're defining how your abstractions work in an OOP language, which allows extensibility, um, the time at which you're making decisions about how to abstract things and what extends what and um, what is a sibling of what, the time at which you're defining all those abstractions is the time at which you know the least about what you want to do. And doing things this way by composition um, just denies you the ability to extend um, your objects, and that's cool. Um, it's better, it's cleaner to do things by composition, and we're also doing such uh, statelessly. Um, uh, like the application state, I'm sure we'll get, get into monads at some point and talk about state, but um, yeah, state is not something that uh, propagates, it's not something that you have to uh, necessarily spend a lot of time keeping track of. Um, it's very scoped, I assume. It's very limited to very specific parts of the application. Uh, and the rest of this is just defining how you redirect your code from one point to another. Um, I will have to read more about state somewhere. Okay, module plugs are another type of plug that allows us to uh, define a connection transformation in a module. Um, it needs to implement only two functions, init, um, which initializes arguments or options to be passed to call. Call, which uh, carries out the connection transformation. Uh, call slash two is just a function plug we saw earlier. Um, so we have function plugs and module plugs. Um, I'm confused about the purpose of the differentiation or distinction here. Um, we are able to add this module plug to our browser pipeline. In the init callback, we pass a default locale. We're also able to use pattern matching to find multiple call function heads to the locale in the params and fall back to en if there's no match. Um, Knit do default. So I guess, yeah, if you wanted to define a function and then have um, an initializer for the function, in the case where you're missing or just not specifying a parameter, this allows you to do that sort of um, thing. Um, okay, well. So that's plugs. I imagine a lot of this is going to be dry reading that's really helpful stuff. I mean, there's channels. That scroll bar up here kind of scares me. Um, what I'm most curious about at this time is Ecto models. And yeah, currently Ecto has adapters for Postgres and MongoDB and SQLite and other databases that nobody wants to use. I joke again. Um, so, uh, Phoenix applications integrate Ecto and the PostgreSQL adapter by default. For general guide to Ecto, so, oh. Uh oh. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Oh my god. Well, at least there's examples in here. Um, I don't want to read this anymore as much as I'm curious about it. 
Could you not have broken this at least into two pages? Did this really need to be a single page? I mean, you did break out the Ecto Getting Started Guide. But I'm curious about what is an Ecto model. And apparently you can't tell me that in a thousand words or less. Yeah. Yeah, Ecto is the DB abstraction layer. And, um... Oh, boy. Now that we have Ecto and Postgres installed and configured... I mean, you don't start your explanation of what is the Ecto model with now that all we have now that we all have this installed and configured the easiest way to generate no you start with what is an Ecto model and then I mean this stuff for like how to get started goes in the getting started guide it doesn't go here okay well I'm gonna uh, skim my way through this and pretend I understand it um, back to create. Da, da, da. No, back to the details. If we have a database server, blah, 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 blah. if we take a look at this, we'll see that it adds the column. I mean, yeah, I understand you define a script, it makes your database stuff. Um, Okay, here's something a little bit uh, less, um, I don't know, something a bit more well-established, I want to say. Our Hello Phoenix repo is the foundation we need to work with databases in a Phoenix application. It's automatically generated. Here's an example. It has two main tasks. Okay, 500 words into this, our repo has two main tasks, to bring in all the common query functions from Ecto repo, and to set the OTP app o, uh, name equal to our application name. Okay. And Phoenix generated this, it made all these values. Okay, so what's the point? Or, uh, it's the foundation. We need to work with databases. Define module Phoenix repo do. Use Ecto with OTP of Phoenix. Okay, fine. You do have to mention the repo. I guess it defines the binding between your application and um, your database controller. Uh, Okay, the model. Models have several functions. It defines the fields of our schema as well as their types. They also handle data validation and typecasting with change sets. Um, <laughs> here's the user model. It says that the name's a string and the number of pets a user has as an integer. Now, could we make the number of pets of a user an optional integer? I don't know, man. That's way out there. Because what if you don't know how many pets a user has? What if they don't have an email? Okay. <laughs> I mean, no, this just defines your data types as well as the constraints that... Um, Elixir and your application enforce upon those types and you can define like a change set um, cast parameters must be these parameters require all the param oh okay so I was gonna say what if you don't know the number of pets and in which case um, this user is not allowed to go into the database you need to know how many pets that user has uh, it's absolutely vital 
let you know how many pets a user has. Yeah, that's funny. Um, but yeah, this is all based on the Phoenix template, which uh, Curry helped me install earlier. Um, so that particular template requires that, you know, that's just vital information. Okay, so next, change sets and validations. They define a pipeline of transformations our data needs to undergo before it'll be ready for the application to use. We're talking about sanitizing data, typecasting validation, filtering out, yeah, yeah, yep, 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 yep. So, yeah, this is really transparent stuff. The point of this is so that you're not writing validation code the way that some um, Java developers who do interesting things with acronyms and acrophobia and such. Um, I mean, the way their code works works to the extent that um, uh, whatever they are demoing happens to work on that given day. The way this works is you have to define things in a very explicit manner, telling you exactly how to validate your stuff. And because it's so explicit, um, also it's all defined in one place in the code, and that place is in your data model. So it doesn't matter if you decide I'm going to go from Postgres to MSSQL Server to SQLite, and it doesn't matter what your back end is, it doesn't matter what all your front end classes are. You define all of um, the relations in your data and how you're going to validate it over here. Um, you're not going to define that in imperative code. So um, I only call that out because I did get ticked off trying to code some of that. Like I'm patient, but uh, th this makes so much more sense. Why would you not do it this way? have your data model define um, your patterns as opposed to just saying you know I'm gonna have some imperative code that validates things when I feel like validating them um, also it doesn't matter what your front end is if you decide to do things in um, using some sort of template that does things in JavaScript great if you do it on uh, jQuery or angular or I don't know I don't even know what all the front-end plugins are, but this will define all the rules that any front-end plugin needs to satisfy. Um, and presumably some of these could be enforced as database constraints as well. So if you're swapping out your database, um, you still get all these useful constraints when you go to regenerate your fields and so on and so forth. Um, let's make number of pets optional. Oh, good. They do point this out. <laughs> Great. Uh, what happens if we pass a key value pair? It's neither defined in the schema nor required. Well, I'm curious because MongoDB allows you to pass in keys and values um, that weren't expected by the schema because the schema is a document. Um, so, yeah. I guess what you're passing in is still valid. You're passing in just more information, random key of random value. Sure. Um, you can also check the change sets changes. The map we get after all the data transformations are complete. Oh. Oh. So our change set here, where, yeah, our change set says we're going to cast. I guess this is a downcast, um, down to name, email, bio, and number of pets. So once we do the downcast here, random key and random value are removed because those aren't part of the model. What if we had a requirement that all biographies in the system must be at least two characters long? Um, yeah, you can add some more constraints on your change set. I guess these are validated application side as opposed to database side, so that's pretty cool. Uh, there are many more validations and transformations you can perform. Like, uh, presumably, if you have a password system and you're actually doing passwords using text as opposed to 2FA or something reasonable, whatever, you could 
say that your password has to have like a breakfast cereal and the name of your favorite president or something like that. Um, yeah. Nah, I wouldn't blame yourself too much for that particular um, issue. Uh, let's see. Well, if your cat's name is X. No, you, you aren't allowed to have a cat whose name is X. See, that that's just user error right there. Um, if you try to create a user with the email of personexample.com, that's not an email. Okay. Um, controller usage. Uh, X isn't a real name. Uh, it's clearly that's user error. At this point, we can see how to use Ecto in our application. Luckily, Phoenix gave us an example. Oh, well, that's spiffy. Right. No duh. Of course it did. Uh, except I did. I created the application without Ecto, so whatever. Um. Generated controller action by action. So, hello Phoenix dot user. Uh, so we can name our struct user instead of hello Phoenix dot user. Um, oh, well that's syntactic sugar. That I guess it's okay, but yeah, it'd be better to say like alias user hello phoenix dot user or whatever but fine so you're saying within the scope of the controller we can alias that first action index um, for each user render uh, index.html no that's not for each this is repo dot all um, whole purpose of this is to get all the users and display them in the template. Um, okay. Note we do not use a change set here. The assumption is the data will have to pass through a change set in order to get into the database. So the data coming out should already be valid. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to find new I mean, I've done all this, or seen all this done um, for uh, Ruby on Rails again. Where you've got a new action and a index action and a create action. And um, the point here that's trying to point out is like how change sets are used. Um, so actions are not surprising. Change sets are useful information. Um, this syntax is curious. User change set. Um, but okay. I guess that's a. I would call that an instance, but we're not talking about instances here. Um, although we do use a change set even though we do not use any parameters when we create it. Yes, it's a user... I guess that's an instance with an empty parameter set. How about that? It can be rendered if we have invalid data in the change set will then contain errors that we need to display back to the user. Use new.html as a change set in both places for consistency. Once the user submits the form, rendered with new.html above, uh, the form elements and their values will be posted as parameters to the create action. Um, share some steps with the IEX interactive elixir experiments we did above. Um, oh, so this allows us to render back the user uh, with the parameters. Um, and then if this passes validation um, can 
to be rendered if we have invalidate and then create. So where does the validation happen? I guess it doesn't matter. Although I'm curious. Um, I mean, this is all functional, so like timing of things doesn't matter. But I'm just curious, um, how do I know that validation does happen? Once the user submits the form rendered from new.html, form elements their values will be posted as parameters to the create action. We've already defined the model that uh, defines the change sets. So yeah, this is our Hello Phoenix user. Oh, that's what confused me. Uh, is that we aliased Hello Phoenix user as user later, and so I forgot that uh, Hello Phoenix user has this set of change sets for validation. Um, so when you post a user, that is going to get validated as part of trying to post it. Um, this all gets enforced at time of posting. Um, so within this, there's no mention of, okay, a post is happening. Um, so, I mean, we create the new.html, display the used, uh, the new.html. Once they submit the form, this is the key point, is that the posting occurs and the posting performs all the validation and validation is our change set that would happen on a new user instance given the user parameters. Um, and we have the repository um, this change set. Oh, so your change set could contain potentially multiple things that are going to be inserted. Um, or updated. I guess that comes out of the semantics of how repo works. But um, if we passed validation, then we make an attempt to insert into the database. Um, or maybe this is the point at which the validation is enforced. I guess, it, again, it doesn't matter. It could be a time of them submitting the form um, even before we hit the create function that maybe some of this gets enforced. Um, but we have handling for an error condition as opposed to an okay condition. Um, uh, <laughs> whatever. So note that the we get the user parameters uh, by matching the user key in the function signature. Okay, there's the user key. So out of this map, there's a key by the name of user, which gives us the parameters. Then we construct a new user instance um, and apply the user parameters on top of it, and that's our change set. And we do the validation. Okay. You know, it would be nice if they could have deconstructed that a little bit, so I didn't have to figure that out. But. Um, if we errored, we re-render new.html in the show action, we get, we use the geep, uh, repo get exclamation point slash two uh, to fetch the user record identified by ID we just, that we get from the request parameters. We don't generate a change set here because it's assumed that the data was passed through a change set on its way to the database, and therefore, yeah, if we can display a user out of the database, um, it's assumed that the data in the database is same. Which is probably fine. Um, the update action is nearly identical to create. The only difference is that we use update one instead of insert one, update one, when used with the change set, keeps track of fields which have changed. If no fields have changed, update won't send it. Huh. That 
Um, I, I'm not sure about that. That's an interesting statement. That if we haven't changed any data, don't send any data to the database. Um, I guess what you're saying is that just don't have these sorts of server-side functions which do things on update or before update um, because sometimes there might not be an update statement. So, yeah. Uh, I guess that makes some sense, but this kind of surprises me. Um, you're saying that just don't try to do fancy stuff in your database because, um, yeah, insert will always send all data to the database, but update um, won't send any data if there aren't any data changed. <laughs> it's an interesting design decision. Finally, we get to the delete action. Here we also pattern match for the ID because you probably want to check if ID is a valid value before trying to delete out of a um, whatever document, table, or collection you're using. Um, there's nothing in the generated code to allow a user to change their mind about the deletion. In other words, there's no are you sure modal. Uh, so an errant mouse click will delete data without further warning. It's up to us as developers to add this in if we feel we need it. I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, anyway, I'm sure you could find a library that defines the sort of thing if you don't feel like um, writing it yourself. You can use delete with a bang because we expect it will... <laughs> okay. Uh, that's interesting. So when you put a bang, does that mean that the code works? And if so, does that mean you just want to do everything with a bang? No, that would be ridiculous. Um, that's the end of our walkthrough of Ecto usage and our controller actions. There's quite a bit more than Ecto models can do. Take a look at the Echo, Ecto documentation for the rest of the story. Okay, so that was a lot of examples, not much in the way of philosophy discussion. That's pretty heavy stuff and um, data relationship and dependencies um, yeah I trust that this works similar to Rails too um, where you have a video that belongs to a user or a forum post that belongs to a user or really anything that belongs to a user you get a chess game that belongs to a user and then you have a move that belongs to a chess game and whatever Note that we don't declare the user ID field in the... Oh, really? Really? You're going to point this out? Okay. Um, we add it to the required or optional field list instead. Um, yeah. It makes sense that you don't define the schema uh, of the relation. Because that could vary with the database implementation. And see, all that complexity is put into Ecto. Oh, bang is for operations to indicate if something doesn't work, raise an exception. Okay. It's when it's done when you don't want to explicitly handle the error with pattern matching. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, we use our newly... Exception back here. Just assume it always works. Uh, that's spiffy. I'll have to look into how exception handling works in um, a functional programming environment. Uh, we don't declare the user ID right, so we just got through reading that. Because we declared a relationship in Hello Phoenix user user will now contain a videos property which starts out as an unloaded relationship. In order to properly display it, we need to tell Ecto to preload the field. Um, 
Note that repo preload is smart enough to work on just one model or on a collection of models. Um, yeah, I wonder if you have lazy loading or eager loading or um, anyway. Um, integrating Ecto into an existing application. Um, integrating it is easy. Since we use include Ecto and Postgrex as dependencies, there are mixed tasks to help us. Okay, I will trust this and come back to it if I ever need it. Um, yeah, yep, yep. We can generate the models using mixed tasks. I mean, this all makes sense. These are common sense measures. They are used in Rails. Um, so we do the same damn thing in Phoenix. Um, yeah, it makes sense that uh, you want to have some way of having functions that fail fast. Um, so you can detect that and handle it appropriately. If two people try to delete the same user at once, uh, it's up to you to handle uh, the details of that delete. Um, that's exciting. Um, so we got through Ecto models for the most part, although we didn't read all the related articles. Um, for a more general guide for Ecto, we look at the Ecto getting started guide. Is this X outside of Phoenix framework? Uh, yes, it is. So that's why it has this fun name. Okay. I see. So, yeah. Well, no, it's, even though it's on a different domain, they're mentioning Elixir. Um, so that's pretty cool. Setting up the database, creating the schema, inserting data, validating changes, our first queries. Yeah, OK, I get it, I get it. Um, uh, still no notes about philosophy, but whatever. Um, we're talking about a model here. How philosophical can you get? Um, uh, I think the functional languages referential transparency breaks down when you interact with the outside world because <laughs> you're not talking about handling state. Um, in Haskell, you've got an IO monad, but honestly, at that point, uh, what is and what isn't functional does start to get fuzzy because you still need exception handling when interacting with things outside your program, like the database, and like input and output. Yeah. Um, now that's a fair criticism, that if you really need to handle um, the case where you attempted to delete something and it failed to delete, you're talking about statefulness. Um, and that's got to be defined here somewhere. Um, I know I didn't make my way through controllers here. Maybe controllers would describe um, something similar. Um, but yeah, I guess the other thing is like if you're using channels to uh, propagate data, then perhaps you don't need um, a more imperative style of handling things because a user would not be able to attempt to delete something that's already been deleted. Um, if the, the fact that a user's already um, deleted, if user A has already deleted a record, user B should immediately, or pretty soon thereafter, see that that record was deleted. So you don't really have that much contention if channels propagate information correctly and if they don't propagate the information correctly, then yeah, you could do something more explicit, like um, prior to the delete. Um, in fact, yeah, you wouldn't use get exclamation point. You'd want to use get and then have some way of handling, um, did I actually find the user? And you'd put this in one port, one part of the code. Um, and I don't know. Um, you would have to have something like a monad. 
um, somewhere to handle the stateful transactional nature of some of this. Um, so the functional nature is going to break down somewhere. Um, testing. Okay, well, let's skim through controllers and see if they define anything even resembling a monad. Flash messages, rendering, da -da, assigning layouts, overriding rendering formats, setting content types and HTTP status, redirection. Um, yeah. I'm just going to assume that somehow in channels um, they define statefulness somewhere. You can't do something entirely functionally. Uh, somehow, somewhere, state does eventually need to be handled. Um, the point of a monad is truly composition by composing effectual or effectful functions so we got socket handlers routes channels pub sub um, transports etc yeah so you have event handling. Okay, so here, yeah, you'd have event handling, and you'd have something, a user submitted an, some sort of event saying that they want to delete the last chess move or something. And you discover that it's already been deleted, and you have your error handling inside um, the channel. Um, the reason why there's such a state monad, so you can compose operations on mutable state elegantly, it's just an abstraction for composition. Um, <laughs> yeah, English is a pretty terrible language to begin with, and the fact that we're talking about a really complicated concept uh, does um, challenge English. But yeah, the reason why there's such a thing as a state monad is so you can compose operations which uh, elegantly operate on a mutable state. Yeah. Okay, so we handle incoming events. Um, yeah, I guess you could define your own error types where if, like, the thing you tried to delete is already says I couldn't delete it or couldn't find it to be deleted and um, then you could return some more generic error type which could be rendered back here. Um, a monad is just I don't know I think you're wrong you're clearly wrong a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors we're going to prove this right or wrong. All right. <laughs> yeah. Who first said this? Is a monad really a monoid in the category of endofunctors? Oh. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, but you have to consider a special kind of category, a monoidal category. Let's start with a monoid. Let's have some kind of multiplication in a unit element. Here we're looking for multiplication of endofunctors, which are functors from a category to itself. You can always compose endofunctors by applying them one after another. Um, you can use composition of endofunctors as our monoidal multiplication. Note that composition of functors is associative. The unit of this multiplication is the identity endofunctor. Oh, the Stack Overflow post is good. Okay, we'll go over the Stack Overflow. I was like, there's no way that Stack Overflow... I could see, like, Stack Exchange, like Server Fault, or not Server Fault, but somewhere else in Stack Exchange. I would expect to see an answer to this. SO itself, I would not expect to, like, answer this. <sighs> 
Philip Battler. Original quote from Saunders MacLean in Categories for the Working Mathematician. Here it is in context. Took a stab there. All told, a monad in X is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors of X with product X product times replaced by a composition of uh, endofunctors and the unit set by the identity endofunctor. Um, it's just an isomorphism between categories. Um, I mean, I get what an isomorphism is. I don't know what you mean by between categories other than it's something that can operate for category A mapping to category A from category B mapping to category B. Um, it's just a way of isomorphizing uh, within a given category. Um, structure preserving the mapping. So a monoid is a set, an operation, or an element satisfying these laws. Um, it's transitive. Um, it's what? E times a, E operate A is equal to A operate E is equal to A for all A and S. So yeah, like you were saying, it preserves the mapping. You're not losing information. It's just an isomorphic way of um, handling any A and S. Um, it's also transitive or commutative or associative or whatever. Basically, um, probably satisfies all those. A monad is an endofunctor um, from X to X, a natural transformation, um, which means a functor composition uh, within type T, and a natural transformation um, from the identity endofunctor to a value T. Uh, satisfying these laws, um, wait, um, oh yeah, natural transformation. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we're talking about stuff here, basically. With a bit of squinting, you might be able to see that both of these definitions are instances of the same abstract concept. Monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. If you squint a bit, you'll see that. Uh, a simple explanation is uh, isomorphism between categories, a structure preserving map mapping, that's the identity law. Um, so, yeah, I see. That's Spiffy. No, we got it. It's all very mathematical. We got it. We understand. No, <laughs> I'm not going to do a zog. <laughs> uh, yeah. So take the set of all strings and form a monoid under the operation of concatenation. Or that forms a monoid under the operation of concatenation. Um, is all strings, with the empty string being the identity element. Sure. Um, so yeah, so some sort of um, transformation on that set of all strings that preserves all strings, such as reordering them, but still preserving all of them, would be um, uh, considered a monad. Um, uh, if you had a relationship that were to take the empty string and generate all strings, that would be considered a monad. Um, um, 
I think. Now, Monad is like a Monoid. Okay, yeah, I'm going too far ahead of uh, Curry here. Um, like, hello world. Now, Monad is like a Monoid, but for composition of endofunctors. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I got this backwards then. Yeah, if you have the identity um, transforming into S, if you had S itself, or if you had an operation on S that produces S, um, satisfying these constraints in terms of... Um, I'm not sure what E refers to here. Um, wait, oh, E is the identity, or the one element. Um, from which we generate us. Okay, yeah. That's special stuff. Yeah, it's hard without practical examples, which is why you don't make these sorts of statements in general, because all they do is just confuse people, unless those people are mathematicians. Um, but no, I, I don't think the examples of monoids get any simpler than what we have stated here. That it has to be a monoid is a set an operation, an element of S, satisfying um, the commutative property uh, of operation, satisfying that if you have the unit element um, with this operation, that you produce uh, the set. Um, and so yeah, a monad would be doing this sort of thing with an endofunctor. Um, which we explained a little bit ago here. Um, it scrolled up off the top of my chat window uh, that a functor, a functor is just isomorphism within a category. And an endofunctor, I don't know. It's just, it's a thing. A monoid does not imply commutivity. Wait. Um, uh, it's an operation that, given type S, um, oh, is this the product operator? I don't know. There's no explanation of X here. Um... An endofunctor is a category unto itself. Okay. Ah, X here is a category. Endofunctors are functors from a category to itself, like you were just saying. Um, and so if we have a monoid, it, it's a set, an operation, an element of S satisfying these laws. That a operation B, operation C. Oh, that's different than commutivity. Um, I think. Cool. Um, but yeah, A operation B, operation C is equal to A operation B operation C for all A, B, and C in S. And that uh, the unit element um, operation A is equal to the operation, or A operation unit element is equal to A for all A in S. Um, probably wouldn't hurt for me to look at the book too. It's a semi-group with identity. I mean, yeah, it's a subset of the language. Um, but as you're saying, it's a semi-group. Um, I'll start reading through this here. A natural transformation from the identity endofunctor of X 
um, to t. Uh, monad is an endofunctor from type x to type x and it's a natural transformation um, across yeah uh, also known as join so this is <laughs> known as join in Haskell um, that's fun um, both imply very little math background okay uh, conceptual mathematics. I mean, I've taken theory of computation before. This shouldn't be such a big stretch for me. Um, yeah, let me mute that over there and take a look at this video. Category theory by Bartos Miliuski. What's a category? Uh, okay. That's fun stuff. Category theory for programmers. Additional material at uh, looks like a blog URL. Um, a monoid is a set of objects and a method of combining them. Numbers you can. Well known monoids are addable numbers, um, concatenable lists, sets you can union together. Um, that would be a monoid. A monad would be a special kind of set and a special way of combining the objects. Um, oh, so monad um, is not only a grammar for combination. Actually, no, grammar does define a domain as well. So this a monad is a grammar, if I understand grammar correctly. Um, but it's also yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a very special sort of grammar. Um, yeah, so I'll check out the videos and stuff. That's cool. Yeah, like I said, I didn't expect Stack Overflow to contain a very formal answer. Although, that uh, was okay. Yeah. Here's the same Bartos fellow, I believe. Yeah, Bartos Miliuski. PhD in quantum field theory. Um, start with a monoid. It must have some sort of multiplication or some sort of function and a unit element. Um, here we're looking at multiplication of endofunctors, which are functors from a category to itself. Or a join, f yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could be wrong. Um, you can always compose endofunctors by simply applying them one after another. Um, they form a category um, is ignoring dimensionality. Uh, the objects are endofunctors and morphisms are natural transformations. Um, objects are endofunctors and the morphisms are natural transformations. Oh, so yeah, we saw the natural transformation. Um, definition of natural transformation is defined here at Stack Overflow. Would be uh, t function t resulting in t. Um, so that's all that's meant by natural transformation. 
Um, we also have the monoidal structure given by composition and by the identif the identity endofunctor. Uh, the category of endofunctors is thus a monoidal category. And this is such a silly question. <laughs> Because it presumes a lot of knowledge and yet tries to explain things in a very intuitive sense. Uh, even to people who don't necessarily know what they're talking about. Although clearly the PhD here, I mean, he knows it all. The monoidal category, you define a monoid by um, picking a particular object, hence an endofuncture, or here an endofuncture. You can square this object um, using monoidal multiplication a morphism from the square t um, from the square to t is the multiplication um, we're talking about like a joining from a 2d space into a um, to a 1d space Think of the square of t is a generalized reservoir of pairs uh, to be multiplied right so this is a reduction. Um, so the unit in this monoid is a morphism from identity to T. The unit in this monoid, uh, this monoid, would, where is this monoid? Where does he first talk about this? Let's start with the monoid. That's where he starts saying this monoid is referring to that way up here. Um, morphism from the square t uh, operate t to t is the multiplication. The unit is a morphism from Oh, okay. In Haskell, the components of these natural transformations are called join and return. Yeah, in Ruby, I think um, this would be called reduce and return, but that's cool. Um, that's functional programming for the win. Um, so, with that digression, uh, is there anything more I want to look at here? Bonus guides! Guys, look! So many bonus guides. Upgrading Phoenix. Static assets. Mixed tasks. Using MySeq... <laughs> Why would you do that? Anyway, custom primary keys. File uploads. Send the email. Sessions. Custom errors. Oh, that's something I was looking at. We're discussing earlier would be how would you do error handling you know if errors ever were to occur um let's take a quick peek at look learning elixir okay quick peek done it's referencing all the other stuff basically read the stuff it's out there it's cool it's fun um custom errors uh phoenix does provide an error view um Oh, join or bind is not a reduce. It's not a catamorphism. Oh. Okay. Interesting. Sorry, then. Um, let's see. It will detect any... Oh, yeah, great. Because the dimensionality is unchanged. Yeah. Because of all those properties we were just looking at. So you're taking a product and joining it together. That isn't, yeah, it's not a reduction. Um, we'll detect any 400 or 500 status level errors and use render2 to render an appropriate error template. Right, yeah, right, sorry. Yeah, you're right, That it's not a dimensional change. Uh... Okay, that was the fine point I was a bit confused on, is 
um, what are you composing? You're composing endofunctors. That makes sense. Um, oh, so that's the composition operator. Uh, right. Phoenix will detect 400 or 500 level uh, status level errors. In the application, use render2 in the error view to render an error template. We can customize the implementation of uh, the error template, but what if I want custom errors? What if I don't want a 400 or 500? What if I want, okay. Define, it provides a macro called def exception for defining custom exceptions. They are raised as structs, and structs need to be defined inside of modules. In order to create a custom error, we need to define a new module. Conventionally, this will have error in the name. Um, inside the module, we need to define a new exception with def exception, uh, like there. That's an example. Um, also define a module within a module to provide a namespace for the inner module uh, optionally. So you can have a router which defines a no route error module. Um, you could also um, define a namespace um, for the inner module like they've done here. Wait, no, they didn't do that here. There's no define a module to define the namespace. So this is just a router, no route error. Um, okay, plug provides a protocol called plug exception specifically for adding a status to exception structs. Okay, spiffy. Um, so yeah, if you were to um, handle an error somehow, um, I guess this shows error handling. I would have started this with how, what is an error and then how do you handle it. But I tend to think in terms of imperative uh, code. And this is functional, so you want to define your framework for how to handle an error. And then, oh yeah, here's what an error looks like. Um, so that's spiffy. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all these other bonus guides. So that's pretty cool. Um, seeding data, also known as statefulness. <laughs> oh, wait, no, you're talking about setting up data in a database. Oh. Now I'm disappointed. I was thinking, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, yeah, you're talking about scripting to seed data, but how do I use this for unit testing purposes? Um, Uh, we talk about this all in terms of scripting. If one, we could add. So again, we're talking about a database. We're not. Oh, models are initialized. Oh, right, 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 right. So yeah, we were talking about earlier how you could have. Um, um, I'm gonna misspeak if I try to speak any further of that. But you have initialization. Um, so this is helpful since if we make a programming error trying to add a duplicate entry to a table where the field is required to be unique, the data in our database won't lose its integrity. Um, the database will refuse to execute the query and Ecto will throw an exception, which will be followed by a description of any constraint errors. Um, As long as we use the bang function, the initialization will fail if something goes wrong. And also, yeah, there's really not a whole lot describing 
error handling. Um, is there something at least describing testing? I know I saw something about testing here earlier. Um, eh, I seem to have lost it. Oh well. Yeah, I still think there's still promise to this. Um, I'll need to come up with a good example of something I want to do and be motivated to do it. And, um, you know, like I said earlier, my goal today was to do some GUI programming, and then I ended up sidetracked from that because it didn't work so well. And end up here trying to look at like how does server code work. Um, I have slightly better appreciation of how this works um, than I used to have. But there's a lot more experimentation and learning to be done other than, hey, look, it's a lot like Rails, but functional. Um, yeah. Um, I'm partly blaming my slowness on, uh, well, I guess I just didn't read uh, documentation explaining um, the language itself. I'm partly blaming the user guides here for not being, well, not being the way I would have structured it, but also not delving too deep into the theory. And assuming you understand the theory and the reasoning why you'd want to do things this way, um, this itself is not a compelling guide for explaining to somebody why they'd want to use Phoenix Framework. It's a guide of how to use Phoenix Framework to meet your ends. And I'm sure that someday somebody will make a guide explaining well, why would you want to do this? Um, so, people who have done this probably also author books and videos and resources. Um, so that's how uh, they make a living doing some of these things, and they're not so incentivized to um, say, don't buy the book because I'm just going to put the contents of the book on my webpage. No, they want you to buy the books. They want you to appreciate the efforts that people have put in thoughtfully to make this possible. Um, looking for wide participation. They're more interested in doing things well than getting everybody to do this. They don't have some kind of side agenda, as far as I know. Um, whoops, didn't mean to click that. So, yeah. Maybe I just end this here saying, look, there's a community out there. You can join in to the free node Elixir Lang channel. Just hang out there. Look at the mailing list. Read the bug reports. Uh, follow them on Twitter. But um, that's probably more helpful all in just appreciating what the community's up to with this than with the actual learning which you probably need to do with, as they recommend. And read some books, watch some videos, um, uh, listen to some lectures if you happen to meet these people and they're lecturing about this. Um, but yeah, it's all free, open source, powerful stuff. Um, and it just requires you to fill in the details. <laughs> and how appropriate is that? Uh, for a functional programming sort of um, experience. It's great and abstract. You have to provide the details. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of cheeky. It's unfair to them. Because they've had put in a ton of work making this possible. But in terms of motivation, they're not out seeking people to do this. They're out focusing on how to do this right. And um, people who are interested in this have to learn this on their own, apparently. I might experiment this again uh, more at a time where I have a really compelling project I'm interested in doing with this. I just figured that since I did the first um, video about um, my experience trying to set up Phoenix Framework and saying just how this is great and how even though everything was going terribly during that demo that it's still a good language 
and eventually getting a little bit pithy about, well, it's not working exactly the way I wanted it to, and in fact, I couldn't even get the Hello World application going, and, you know, just ran out of time, and it was hilarious. Um, how I'm defending the concepts, but saying that just none of it seems to work when I do it. Um, I figured it'd be appropriate to do this follow-up, and we've made it some steps closer just in reading through documentation together. Um, but yeah, if and when there's a part three, hopefully I'll have uh, something much more compelling to do and show and work on together. That's the hope. Maybe the thing to do next time with this would be Acrophobia in Elixir and in Phoenix Framework. Um, and I think originally at the start of this um, session here, that's what I had intended to do. And then I got bogged down in all the documentation. Um, uh, and just in chatting with you all too. So, um, yeah. Uh, Acrophobia could be done in Scala, but I want to do it in Phoenix. I'll see if I can think of something else to do in Phoenix if you really want to run with that in Scala for some reason. Um, but yeah. I'll have to think more about is there something else I wanted to do. Oh, shoot. I had an interesting idea the other day. Um,. I'll see if I can think of it, but it's not coming to you at the moment. Anyway, it's been fun. I'm going to restart the stream soon with a higher frames per second and a higher quality. Um, so that could be fun. Um, so hope this has been enjoyable, if not instructive. Uh, probably not too instructive. But yeah, welcome to Phoenix. So, I'll see you soon.